we added this session after the initial rollout. We didn't obviously do this session in New York. And this is really in response to all the news we've been hearing. I mean, some of the stats are, are pretty scary. 70% increase in data breaches in Q3 2022 over the previous quarter, right? So obviously Australia is obviously copying a lot of heat at the moment, and we're at the forefront of that. But this is a global phenomenon. It continues to be on the rise. And as many of the speakers spoke earlier about, it's this balance between utility and security. Um, but it is horrible when it goes wrong. I mean, the amount of money wiped off of companies, the trust that is lost. I mean, obviously, as we know, the regulators are here are looking to dramatically increase the penalties for not reporting and those kind of things. So that really won't be an option. Some companies were actually making a business decision. Is it better to pay the fine or let people know what happened? So with the huge fines being planned, that option really goes out of the window. So what we decided to do is get this wonderful, illustrious panel up here today um, and talk about a few key things um, and get their opinion. And the great thing is we have a, a different kind of companies, we have different roles, so we're going to get lots of different views on that. So what I might ask the panelists, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, right? On the first question, apart from you, because you did a session earlier, right? <laughs> apart from you, maybe a brief introduction who you are and your role, right? And then we'll roll into the questions. Okay, first one is... I guess it's what we keep, everyone's asking, are we in the industry doing enough to protect sensitive data? And if not, what should we change? Now, I'm, I'll go in reverse order if that's all right. Yep. If you want to introduce yourself, Doug, and, and what you do and, and go from there. Yeah, thank you for having me. Doug Gothel from Alation. Um, so what are we looking at in terms of what can we do better? I think us as a data catalog, and the whole point of it is having it out to the people, we work with Amuda to secure that. I think what we do often not enough of, we focus on the technology solved and not enough about the change of making it's a team sport. We need to get that communication out to the end users at the point of use, right? So it's active governance, it's active security, it's showing up in my Tableau, my Power BI, being able to control that all at one hub that is business digestible because as much as we try and block all the holes, we all got to have to take an active role in participants to guard our data in being there. All right, fair enough. Uh, Brett, would you like to go add something? Yeah, well, introductions first. So hi, I'm Brett Squires, uh, partner with EY, Data Analytics, working primarily in financial services. So this is a very hot topic that we're here. So it's good to be addressing it. Are we in the tech industry? I think I almost want to step back from the tech industry and go, well, actually, you know, as consulting, we're on that, that edge of business and technology. And I think, um, you know, are we doing enough? I think we're not doing enough to educate. And obviously for these issues to have occurred, you know, recently, you know, there's significant breaches. They are going to impact our industry. And so I think educating the CEOs, the COOs, the, the, the data risk side of the story, um, as well as the value side of the story, and having a very, very balanced story to educate people around it. But also, you know, what are, the, what are the controls? They can be implemented. They're possible to be implemented. What's the governance? Having that story to tell and being able to educate more people is, I think, where we as consulting need to go. Um, because the technology is out there, and I think we'll talk about that. Well, quite a bit. We're talking about the same thing, is that it needs to be not a solve just from the risk team and from the technology, as you're saying. And people, if we say we're driving a data culture, well, we got to treat that as a strong asset, and we collectively need to look after it. So it's more of a holistic approach. It is that education and getting people involved in the process. How much did this recent, obviously, spate, it, was it the wake-up call we needed? Is it going to release budgets and get people thinking in the right way? Or are we going to go back to complacency and to have it you know, repeated and repeated again? And what, from what you've, your customers so far? Yeah, so I think, um, obviously, in financial services, um, financial services have a fairly defensive view around data, a data risk lens on it. So I think this has brought it into a little bit of an acute focus. Um, and sometimes that acute focus is needed to go make change, to educate. Um, but it's really how do we manage that now? How do we sort of have those proof points that we're actually managing the risk well so that you know, as we reduce that risk, we have more confidence around what we do with data because there's more of it every day. There's more that we want to use for digital experiences for all the, all the upside. Um, but it's really about managing the downsides well and clearly. And I think that's... Again, back to that education, back to that, um, the, the work we need to do with the, the business around, yes, there's an acute issue that's occurred, 
but really here is the, here's the way we're going to go about that and people being confident that that's, that's something we can do and roll out across a huge ecosystem of data and, and, and technology that's there. Yeah, All so. right, brilliant, thank you. Alison, so introduce yourself. Hi, Hi good afternoon everyone. Addison Souza, I'm part of the Databricks platform and security team. And going to your question, I think, uh, I always like to think that we can do more. Uh, I think, especially with everything that is happening, you would be a bit naive to say that it's all on the customer side and we then just don't have anything that we can add. So to do that, I think I'd like to take a step back and a term that has been used a lot over the past decade with public cloud is the shared responsibility, right? Where we map what the customer needs to do and what the vendor needs to do when providing a technology. And I think we can do more, take more responsibility or simplify what the customer does on their side. I think sometimes we tend to overcomplicate things. Uh, of course, there needs to be some customizations. Different customers will use the platform differently, but I think having a secure, strong baseline is something that us as vendors can do more. This, collaborate, this that is happening right now, collaboration, right? I think our field is too broad to think that one vendor can do everything. I think uh, there is space and we need to understand the ecosystem and the people we work with uh, to, to, to bring that to customers and enhance their security posture and make them more successful. And I agree with everyone on the educational part of it. I think we as vendors need to be closer to the customer. Again, another great thing that the cloud is the consumption model. It kind of encourages vendors to stay engaged once someone starts adopting a technology. So I think uh, that's another area that we can we can help. All right, brilliant. Max, uh, are we doing enough? No, uh, I think we're overcomplicating it. I think that's mm. the biggest issue right now. Um, I would argue there's, there's just so many vendors out there. And so I think the, the problem isn't necessarily the education. I think we all realize it's important. Um, for those here that aren't familiar with it, like um, uh, forget the, the drinking, we get a, 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 it's kind of like a, DoorDash, but for booze and uh, Brazily or something like that. But uh, anyway, the CEO was fined by the FTC in the US. Um, and for the rest of his career as a CEO, he has to report a security plan. Um, so basically, he's never going to be a CEO again, because who wants to expose those skeletons? But I, so I think that the, the regulatory aspects are there. So I don't, I think people get that problem. I think the problem is like, if I asked anyone here, what's the difference between data security and data governance? And then who solves for that? you probably get a bunch of different answers. So I think like with industry, we have to simplify who does what and how we work together. Um, I think that's what we have to start doing to make it easier for customers to consume. All right. Yeah, I'd like to add to that one. So I, I think as an industry, we don't set the standards. Like, yeah. you know, one of the things I'm very passionate around is the idea of data as a product and a product owner and that product mindset, but that maybe there's a security angle to that, you know, to that role. Right. You know, so you know, we've got to be clearer on our roles around data, but also clearer around you know, the tooling should sort of support those, those roles and those accountabilities around protecting data. Yeah, just, just to pull in the, the thread real quick is, is like, I, where, when I talk to a lot of like, more senior executives, their assumption is someone's assigned in their organization that role. And then they go and look and they find out no one is <laughs> assigned that role. And so it's like really difficult, I think, because everyone says, oh, I'm, I'm head of governance, and what does governance mean? So I, I think as, as we see uh, privacy and regulatory oversight of data become more prolific, I think it's the onus is on this group here, like dictating who does what and how and why and that architecture. Mm. I mean, I think it's fair to say that a lot of security is reactive. You know, it, it's maybe sort of an afterthought rather than being security by design, and, and I think Building that in, uh, thinking right from the beginning is, is obviously what we all need to do. All right, look, thank you for that. I mean, your experience working with customers, you know, what have you learned about sort of blind spots that customers might have? Do they have like areas that, that you know, we really need to particularly focus on the education side of things? I would say it's not just education. Obviously, you need a, the tools to support, but it's the education of making it part of the natural behavior. Right, and using those tools for that. For example, I have a 12-year-old son. We live in the city in Surrey Hills. I can't protect him every step of the way, but I need to lead him. He takes my guidance to therefore make his own decisions and, and be innovative, but in a safe way. That's what that governance is, and it's continuing to take people on this path. Just saying that I have a chief risk officer, I have somebody who does security, isn't enough. It needs to be, if we're really talking data mesh, 
the product. As you just said, Matt, it's not just owning the data, it's owning, or maybe you said the security around it. That is a component. So if it, this is an asset, we need to look at it as such and treat it. So the business has that responsibility in every way they act, not just as a compliance checklist. I like, I like that. And um, adding to that a little bit, just to say with Doug a sec, moving to cloud, mm. is, how, how's that complicated, change things, you know, how, or, or maybe yeah. you want to jump in, Brett? I, I'd love to jump in there, because I think um, I do quite a lot of work in getting organizations to cloud. And one of the big challenges and blind spots we see is really um, not what's in production, it's what's in non-production. Right. It's what's in that experimental stage. And um, quite often when we've had that luxury of working on-prem, you know, we've been working with some production-like data sets in development environments. And we're suddenly in cloud and there's a you know, heightened level of possible risk. You know, so I think um, one of our big blind spots is, well, what are we really doing in our development environments and our discovery environments? And have we actually yeah. managed and monitored that risk well enough? Um, and you know, we see it quite regularly, is people are putting data into these platforms that they haven't really thought what the risk lens is on it, yeah. especially well, in non-product. I couldn't agree more. And in our world is going, if you, if you can't find and discover what you have, are we really worried about that governance and the security, right? You need to go and find and understand it. When I'm moving something to the cloud, as you say, it's typically more secure, more thought out, because there's that cost. It's what's laying around the bones in the backyard where I think you're more exposed, yeah. really. And yeah. that kind of gets forgot. We, put all this new framework in front for the new things, but we need to be able to scan and understand what's in the entire landscape. Addison, what, what, what your, I mean, you're the cloud man, yeah, right? No, no. Yeah, I think adding to that, uh, one of the things that I have seen, and, and it aligns very well with what we are talking about and with what Matt talked in the beginning, I think very much related to the complexity that introduces enforcing like least, least privilege, you know? Sometimes you see customers having all these groups within the organization but what I see is sometimes the level of access that they have is much more than they would need to perform their, their functions, right? And then we have certain cases where like, a credential would leak and would give access that could, could have been avoided. I think uh, it's very hard, so I think anything that can help them as a customer to enforce that is a very valuable uh, thing to, to position. Something else that I'm very glad that is getting more and more traction is uh, automation. So mm. you'd see a lot of manual deployments and they are not standardized. One has this particular security feature enabled, that one doesn't, and, and, and then and it ha it's hard to keep track of it going forward. So I think I'm seeing more and more customers engaging us to discuss automation and how that can be used for their deployments. I think it's a, it's a positive direction for the industry. Um, I outside of everything that was just said, because it's accurate, I think the biggest blind spot I see is, is the desire to do it the way we've done it before when mm. we go to cloud. I don't think that paradigm works anymore. Um, and I think that w w central authorities are trying to create central accountability, but it's asked, in actuality, we have to go to decentralized accountability, uh, meaning letting all the different BUs in each team be accountable in, uh, around the data that they're processing, and a central authority providing the guidance and framework of how to do that because the amount of data, where as we move to cloud, the number of potential derivative data sources goes up exponentially. So it has to be a de decentralized model. And so I think that's a struggle for a lot of people because they want to do it the way we did it before as a, for those who were in the room, like the whole application serialized layout, that just doesn't work anymore. Because in theory, if you know these cloud compute infrastructure layer it does its job, all that data will be immediately available as soon as you move it in there. And so now, it totally breaks that central par uh, control paradigm, you know? Interesting, interesting. Um, going into next year, all right, here's the multi, you know, the big <laughs> dollar question. Going into next year, what's the most important step a company could take to not be that company on the front page of the newspapers next year? I mean, obviously, there's lots of things, but what would you suggest? Well, we'll keep the same order. Um, same so. order. Uh, well, to me, it is actually, like you said, finding the, the bones, the skeletons in the closet. So how do I scan and understand what is there? Because it's often you don't know. And if, even if we've had strong controls before, what that often does is get people to build around it. Or my data lake explodes, and do I know where things are? So that data provenance, where it's been, the lineage through to what I'm finally consuming, you can do that quite easily. And when we then find that, we can use the things like Amuda to lock that down very quickly and understand it. So I think it's taking stock 
I think the one thing, it seems like a simple question that Optus brought up is, can you tell me where this stuff is? Mm. And most people can't, right? So that's a simple start. And then we can begin to, what's the appropriate framework for that decentralized, which sort of is kind of saying, and even in the joking with a kid, I can't govern him every day as a decentralized. I give you my beliefs to act in best interest for all knowledge workers. That's where that decentralized comes in so we can manage the, the scale that's coming. So but it's really, it's the, really the ability to search, discover, and be able to explain, when I get audited, do you know what you have and where it is? We could stop a lot of those audits if we could answer that, but we can't at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, obviously EY has an audit and an assurance sort of lens on what we do, and I think it is about that discoverability of data, being able to demonstrate that there is a control, that there is a policy, that there is an owner, that there is a role established to, to monitor that, or a tool that's there to, to monitor it. So I think looking ahead, it's around discovering it and sort of being able to demonstrate that we have a level of control over the risk, and we know where the risk is, like the, the nine box model that you showed, very, very nice. Like if we can sort of manage that risk and reduce that risk, um, and demonstrate that over time, I think that's, uh, that's really what we should be trying to do. So that means that we can be more confident, the risk has been brought down, and we can keep going with um, you know, generating value from data. Hi, Addison. Yeah, I strongly agree with, with what has been said. Uh, my personal opinion as well is that there is no silver, silver bullet. Uh, what I like to discuss with customers and encourage them is, uh, there's a term, defense in debt. Yeah. Uh, the idea is, instead of putting all all your bet into one layer and making that extra secure is looking at it across the stack in layers, right? Starting from the data, going up to the network, going up to the edge, to the application, to monitoring and logging, uh, and all those complex things that come together to make uh, a secure platform. So I like to look at it and make sure that those layers are well built uh, across the stack. And another thing as well that I think would help is uh, in terms of the mentality, uh, having a security mentality across the board instead of a focus on maybe this is the responsibility of the security team. I think if everyone comes together a security uh, team. using that security lenses yeah. across the project when it starts, when, when engaging vendors and throughout the entire process, uh, I think it will help a lot as well. Yeah. Um, it's a, you know, I, I flip it on its head because uh, these guys are more in the weeds than I am day to day, but like, I actually think top cover, like being able to go to the executive tier and have top cover to be able to implement these programs and, and resource appropriately is the most important thing. I would say, I would argue if, if I could talk to all the organizations that have ever had a data breach or a leak or what have you, I think the argument they would probably, if you, if you go to the root cause, it was they were not resourced appropriately from the top down to put these programs in place. I mean, I've got a dinner with top five, CEO of a top five bank in the world next week. Who the hell am I? Like, but he's trying to figure out, like, at dinner, how does he put capital to work inside his business to ensure that they're not at risk as they move to cloud? Because uh, he's got a CISO that thinks if they go to cloud, the whole bank is gonna fall apart. So I think, mm -hmm. like, do you need to arm your executive teams with the information to be able to execute programs? And then you can put the controls in place. But without that, it ain't going to happen. You know? All right, I'm going to uh, throw one more question at you. Oh, and everyone's now panicking because it's not on our yeah. screen. <laughs> <laughs> and I promised I wouldn't do this. I mean, all sorts of trouble, yeah. right? Um, there was an article. Where, where's Lisa? Who am I meant to be referencing on your slide you sent me about CDOs around the world? Well, we just referenced whoever did the research, so thank you for that. Um, but there was some research we just uh, think about the role of CDO. I'll do this slowly so you get a bit of thinking time, all right? <laughs> so the role of CDO, they did surveys around the world, and actually in Asia Pacific, we only have a fraction of what they have in, in the rest of the world. Something like five times less. So across the whole of Asia Pacific, only 7% of organizations today have a CDO, compared to 30% in other places of the world. Actually, Australia was doing better than most. We were in the 20s, right? I'm just curious, and I'm sorry, if, you know, you can duck it, you can say he's at the time or anything like that, right? <laughs> but the role of CDO, I'll make it start with you, Brett, because obviously this is your bread and butter, <laughs> yeah, right? Is, yeah. The role of CDO, how important is it? 
and why are we lagging in, in putting someone in? And is that, does that link to some of the problems we've had? Uh, that conversation is a very active conversation we're having in a number of financial services organisations. And I think um, the general spirit is we um, have to elevate the role of data in the organisation. It is an executive agenda. We just talked about educating the executives um, on the value and the risk and to have accountability. Like in financial services, there's bare accountability. So you've got to construct a, um, let's say, organisational structure that does elevate the role and the accountability around data, both the value and the risk side of it. So I think that conversation is something we're having, that education around it. Um, there are organisations we're working with that already have fairly established data transformation teams and, and data offices, but there are certainly organisations where that's very, um, in some areas mature and in some other areas very mature. So taking the organisation and journey on just generally elevating the role of data and the ability to sort of not just um, understand where it is, but actually to be able to execute on it well so that you're implementing those controls. Like it's very hard to go back and remediate, but if you're moving forward and you're investing in data, you can build the controls. The technology is there. If you're heading to cloud, there's very, very effective security controls. You know, so I think it's educating and elevating the role of data in their organisation. I mean, it's kind of reflective of their thought process if they haven't elevated it. That's right. Sort of, right? Doug? Well, just defending ourselves a little bit, I would say, you know, we do have the benefit of seeing, you know, first movers in EMEA in the US do things. I would suggest those numbers, if you look at the CDO, they're not so sure what they're doing or how they got the title. They just wanted to grab it. And now there's a lot of responsibility. We'll be hearing about a CDO I know well who'll be talking at four, where it's much more clear in terms of what am I doing? How am I executing? What is my remit? So I think that's become clear. It became a very hot title, but you ask you know, one, any 10, and they'll have a different response in terms of what it is, right? In terms of how they go. A, so a, a, clarity, new, yeah. a clarity on what that means um, is important. And then again, I think we keep coming to this decentralization. Okay. It ties to so many things, because we've been trying to do the central data warehouse, do mm. these things. What's the world talking about? Data mesh, data fabric. We couldn't centralize certain aspects of this. And it's coming the same way with the data. Having a, a risk officer, having a CDO, they can guide it, but it needs to be decentralized out as a business asset with serious you know, outcomes. So this Optus is going to help us in the fact that, you know, I've been in governance for years, and it is an ugly term. People know they need it, but they don't want to. Well, now it's just kind of really brought it to the fore that, ooh, there's actually these consequences here. So hopefully we'll see that ownership broaden. Excellent. And it might not be the title of CDO, right? Right, but I mean, all CDOs aren't created equal is kind of what you're saying, right? Because yeah. it's still a new profession, in the sense, that we're learning. Alison? Yeah, no, definitely. I think you used a word in the end there that I was very strong ownership, right? And mm. having the sense of direction, especially because we're already hearing that things can start changing from a regulation perspective and how we are going to control which sort of data we need to keep, which sort of data we should be getting rid of as soon as we possibly can. Uh, that doesn't make sense to continue holding it for so many years right. Without, right. without having want someone responsible for that. So I think uh, hopefully it's going to be something that we are going to be seeing growing in the region. You, you, you mentioned 7%. I didn't know that is statistic, but it's pretty low, uh, if you think about it. So yeah, I imagine that it is bringing that ownership and responsibility to the petrol of the, of the 21st century. Yeah, all right. The no, oil. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree. Last word, final words, Matt. Uh, yeah, I mean, I actually, well, I would argue, much like any other statistic, it's probably behooves the writer that the statistic works for them. Um, but like, I think like my argument would be is, if, if you looked at platform owners, uh, going back to ownership, there's probably a lot of data platform owners, though. So my, my, my guess is, is that from an executive tier perspective, like there's greater value and there's greater potential salary in being a data platform owner in this region because you have, you have control over the infrastructure and the budget over the infrastructure, whereas the CDO historically is uh, policy and guidance and so therefore less technical control and I think the gravity of data moving into the platforms is a greater power grab. So if the CDO happens to own both the platform and the policy, that's interesting. But if they're not, if they're gonna own the policy and there's a lot more policy in Asia Pacific relative to data than in the US, and EMEA is really emerging, right? I mean, GDPR is relatively nascent. In Asia Pacific, you've had a lot more regulations than the rest of the world around data for much longer. So my guess is, 
CDOs historically here are policy, and most people want to get on the platform because that's, well, it's freaking cool, right? You get to be platform and design and load that new technology. So that would be my argument is I think you're, it's kind of a catch-22. My guess is more people here want it to be on the platform, ownership of the platform mm -hmm. versus driving the policy and some of the, the kind of legacy controls around it. But I don't know, I'm not a data scientist. So. All right, well listen, can I thank you all again for your insights and your expertise. Can we have a round of applause for the panel, please?